Buddhism is a serious contender for the soul of Western civilization. The West has rejected its soul which was the Bible and as it seeks an alternative, uh, Buddhism is a potential and serious contender. Just a few years ago, uh, Jennifer Lopez here in Hollywood was on the set with Richard Gere and obviously the stress of Hollywood, how do you cope with it? Uh, well, Richard Gere helped her uh, discover Buddhism and she was uh, deemed to be a devout Catholic, but uh, found that Buddhism was a lot more helpful to her for coping with the pressures of life in Hollywood. So she became one of the latest celebrities uh, to join Buddhism. Uh, Tom Armstrong had a long essay on e on um, Zen Unbound talking about celebrities in Hollywood who are Buddhists. So obviously, Buddhism is uh, gaining ground. It is appealing to people here, attracting people here. And it is also experiencing a revival in India. Uh, about 50 years ago, Buddhism was virtually non-existent in mainland India. There were a few Buddhists who had come from Tibet up in the north, but uh, the chairman of the, the man who chaired the constituent assembly and wrote our constitution, Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, he decided after 20 years of study and reflection uh, to become a Buddhist. So in October 1956, he became a Buddhist uh, with about 300,000 people and that has grown now to something like three million or more people who have uh, publicly accepted Buddhism, though many more have uh, become Buddhists in faith, though perhaps they might still be socially Hindu or uh, legally Hindu, etc. So it is gaining ground in India and there is a revival up here in the West. Uh, someone told me uh, last year that there are more professors in Scandinavian countries who would think of themselves as Buddhists than any other uh, religious faith or any other ideology. Why is that so? And I want to suggest very briefly that there are three good reasons for people to be attracted to Buddhism. First is that it is a self-help therapy. It requires no priests, it requires no experts as such, it requires no rituals. The core of Buddhism, uh, if, you know, think of a biblical teaching that godliness with contentment is a great gain. If you are craving desiring anxiously uh, something, someone that you don't get, you get into conflicts, you hurt yourself. There is a lot of self-inflicted suffering uh, which comes because we don't sit down to reflect on our own lives, our behavior, our attitude. And uh, a Buddhism at its core and we will be talking about the core of Buddhism because as it has grown during the last 2500 years in different cultures, it has acquired all kinds of shapes and rituals and beliefs which are peripheral and we will not be going into those details, but at its heart, it is um, helping you if you uh, remove the philosophical questions and speculations and metaphysics and if you think of Buddhism in terms of uh, such as just the ethical view of godliness with contentment is a great gain. And that's what Buddha is saying that don't crave for things. Uh, develop contentment and develop godliness or he might not use the word godliness, uh, but meaning the same sort of thing as 
uh, right living and right speech and right thoughts, etc., right attitudes. So, uh, it appeals to people like Richard Gere and uh, Jennifer Lopez because it is a self-help therapy of coping with these stresses and sufferings which we bring upon ourselves. Um, so that's the first point. The second and more important uh, philosophical point which I'll probably repeat two or three times and unfold for you as we go along is that postmodernism is deconstructionism from one particular point of view and Buddhism is deconstructionism par excellence. Modernism that is from the 17th century to uh, the 20th century modernism in the west became a project it is the project of modernism was death of God as Nietzsche put is that God is dead we have killed him not that he once existed and now uh, we have killed him the God actually never existed but now we know that he does not exist and we should not bother with him. So, modernism's project was death of God if God is dead then you cannot exist as an individual soul a permanent entity a real entity. So, postmodernism's project is death of self. The postmodern mind, the postmodern intellect is deconstructing all truths. So, anybody who claims that this is truth, this is my theory, this is what I believe, uh, the intellectuals in our universities would begin to tear it apart, deconstruct it that this is your intellectual construction of reality and here are the problems with it, this is not true. Now, the most foundational myth of the western civilization is not that God exists, but that you exist as a soul. Even Freud or Jung who did not really believe in a biblical God believed in self or at least talked a lot about self. So, postmodernism is deconstructing, peeling the onions of what you think is yourself and finding that there is really nothing at the core of you, you do not really exist. So, uh, it is Buddhism is uh, deconstructionism par excellence of deconstructing one of the foundational myths of secular western worldview. The third point uh, today is that Buddhism offers a practical escape from reason. We will develop these ideas a little bit more as we go along and I will repeat myself two or three times on these weighty ideas. So, if you do not get them the first time do not worry um, that rationalism is dead in the sense that secular enlightenment or modern modernism or the whole uh, in European enlightenment started with the confidence that human intellect, human mind was capable of knowing truth. We could know truth by ourselves without God's grace, without divine revelation. God is there, he has spoken to us, it is very kind of him, but even if he had not spoken to us human mind was capable of knowing him and knowing the truth. This was the assumption of rationalism of the of European enlightenment. Now, that is dead because there is no professor anywhere in the west who believes that human mind could know truth. There are a lot of rationalists, but they are all pessimists. They specialize in telling you why this is not true, why that is not true, why this cannot be true. Uh, that, that we do not know truth, we cannot know truth, anybody who says I know the, the truth is a bigoted fundamentalist. Um, the, so, rationalism has become pessimism, but these professors and these universities are still trapped in rationalism. If rationalism is a method that leads does not lead you to truth, if it only leads to dead ends how do you escape, how do you find an alternative uh, method of knowing truth, experiencing truth. So, uh, Buddhism offers a practical escape from reason. Now, 
The theme uh, of this evening, as I said, is that Buddhism is an art of escaping into nothingness, into emptiness, into void or shunya. It would be the technical term. That's not, I'm not meaning to be uh, pejorative at that point. That's a description of the best of the Buddhist philosophy. There is no God, so there is no loving heavenly father into whose arms a sinner could, could return uh, with repentance. There is no eternal life because yourself, your soul isn't real. There is no permanent soul. There is no, because there is no God, there is no heaven. So Buddhism is talking about escaping suffering, but it isn't saying that we are turning away from suffering or we are turning away from hell to heaven uh, or living by ourselves in a big bad world out there into uh, the home of our loving father against whom we have rebelled. Uh, but since there is no God, there is no heaven, there is nothing out there. Nothingness is the ultimate reality and it is escaping suffering into nothingness. Our notion of our existence as a self is the primary cause of suffering. So uh, that is um, the heart of Buddhism as you might say that the heart of Christianity is uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life that people are going to perish because of their rebellion against God because of their sin uh, but God is inviting them back into a relationship with him on the basis of forgiveness on the basis of transformation of their lives and he is offering eternal life in fellowship with him in his heaven that would be the Christian uh, the essence of Christianity the essence of Buddhism is escaping life, escaping suffering uh, in, uh, into what you really are that is nothingness, emptiness. Now that's a strange concept but uh, it is a viable concept and therefore um, uh, you would need to patiently struggle. What we are doing in these sessions are trying to look at reality from someone else's point of view. Now, you might not be a Buddhist, uh, but I'm inviting you to try and think the way he thought, the way his mind worked, and um, see the strengths or weaknesses of uh, someone else's point of view, uh, uh, sympathetically and as giving uh, the benefit of doubt of, okay, you, you think differently from me, and I will try and understand how you think, how you, what you believe, and why you believe. So that, that's what we are trying to do. Let's begin with a brief description of Buddha's life. I'm sure most of you have studied that in high school uh, or even primary school, though, even though you may have forgotten. Now, Buddha was born around the same time as Isaiah was prophesying in Judah and Israel. 2600 years ago. He was born in a culture which was becoming increasingly Hindu. Aryans had been coming to India from northwest, from Afghanistan, Pakistan side, and Hinduism was spreading in India. His, he was born uh, in a, a grove outside of the town of Kapilavastu, which is South Central Nepal, north of India, though most of his life was actually lived in India, that's where he was enlightened, but he was born in what is technically Nepal now. His mother apparently died during childbirth or soon afterwards. His father was the ruler of his town uh, and his, his, his name was Siddhartha. His clan was Gautama, so we call him Siddhartha Gautama, and the people group was Sakya. When he was born, a seer, a sitta, came and uh, predicted that this child would either become a great king or he would become a great ascetic, sadhu, hermit. So his father was very nervous about this second possibility, 
so became overprotective and the young boy uh, was not allowed to move out and interact uh, with uh, the real world, especially the ascetics, the Hindu gurus, uh, holy men who would be wandering around teaching. In one of his rare uh, forays into the world outside, he encountered an old man and a very sick man who was suffering because of his sickness. He saw a dying, uh, a decaying corpse, body, and then he also saw an ascetic uh, who was uh, wandering in search of truth and enlightenment. Now, because it was a new experience for him to see suffering uh, so powerfully, he began to wonder what life was all about, what reality was life uh, was all about, why did people suffer, how could we end suffering. And so, in his uh, quest for truth, he left home, he left his wife, he left his son and stepped out. The only people who were talking about truth and talking about philosophy were these holy men and ascetics. So, he joined them, learned from uh, them everything that they could teach and they uh, emphasized austerities, uh, penance, uh, inflicting suffering on your body in you know, extreme asceticism as means of uh, finding truth. So, he experienced all of that. He sat in meditation and he deprived himself of food and water and this and that, uh, but nothing helped. He did not find any truth. In fact, more he saw of the lives of these so called holy men, more frustrated he became. But before giving up, one fine day, he, he essentially uh, decided that all of this religious rituals um, and uh, religious uh, exercises, they amounted to nothing. They were no way of finding truth, uh, th uh, these religious extremes and fanaticism. Uh, so, uh, he changed and they say that one day he took some uh, buttermilk from a a young woman uh, to find some strength for his body, sat down under a tree vowing that I am not going to get up until I have experienced en enlightenment. He did have his mystical experience of becoming enlightened and that is when he adopted the title B the Buddha. Buddha is a title meaning the awakened one or the enlightened one. Now, when he uh, became enlightened himself, he began to teach his message and his message was very simple. Uh, his four noble truths were part of the first sermon he gave outside of Varanasi in uh, a place called Sarnath. And the first noble truth was that life is suffering. Now, it sounds very simple. But the beauty of that statement is that it is an empirical statement. It is something which anyone can know to be true from first hand experience that life is suffering. There is no life without suffering. Now, this was powerful, uh, the simplicity of it and directness of it, because in contrast, Hinduism had been teaching a lot of what appeared to Buddha and to common people mumbo jumbo. All the religious teaching, uh, the mantras, shlokas were in Sanskrit, a language which people did not speak, did not know. So, what exactly the priests are muttering, you do not know. They are telling a lot of myths, a lot of stories, a lot of legends about gods and goddesses, and you have no way of knowing what is truth, what is imaginary, what is fiction. Uh, but here was a religious teacher coming with a very straightforward, direct, empirically verifiable statement that life is suffering. This is the first noble truth. So, I am st starting my religious um, reflection and articulation and teaching on solid, empirical, testable foundation. Suffering has a cause and that is our desire, our craving, as Paul would say that those who want to, uh, who have a desperate love for money, they bring a lot of pain upon themselves. 
So that's, that's the kind of thing with which one could identify that suffering has a cause and this is in our desire and our craving. Now there is a way to stop suffering by freeing ourselves from desire uh, which would include uh, freeing ourselves from our notion of self that I exist as an individual self. And then there is a path to end suffering and that is an eightfold path of salvation. So, he had these four noble truths that life is suffering, suffering has a cause which is desire or craving, desire or craving can be ended and there is a eightfold path. Now, that eightfold path ultimately is saying that the path to the enlightenment or salvation is through meditation. That again is a powerful and simple statement which the culture, religious culture of his time would generally share. The beauty of it was that it is undermining the priests and the priestcraft. It is saying that all these rituals, expensive rituals that the priests perform have nothing to do with our salvation or, immense, uh, or enlightenment. The magic, um, penance, pilgrimages uh, which cost you a lot of money and a lot of hardships, they have nothing to do with salvation. Uh, salvation is through meditation, but on that path to meditation you need to have wisdom, you know, right thoughts, right beliefs, right speech, uh, right attitudes, right actions, right livelihood uh, and uh, right behavior and then simple techniques of how to sit down, how to be mentally alert, how to concentrate, uh, right mindfulness etc. The eightfold path of salvation in Buddha is very well known, so I won't spend a lot of time in talking about it because that is something that fifth grade students uh, study. The important point is that the message appeals in India because of its simplicity and directness and in a, in a very real sense uh, as the Hindu, the lower caste Hindus who are rebelling against Hinduism and becoming Buddhist today as they uh, point out that this was something like the Protestant Reformation uh, of uh, Martin Luther who is opposing the buying of uh, indulgences. The church is saying that uh, here is we are selling indulgences if you pay so much money uh, your soul or your grandmother's soul which is in purgatory will be delivered and go to heaven. So, uh, these because the church has the keys to heaven and hell and the keys to salvation uh, have been given to the Pope and um, so if religion begins to be misused by the priests in that way, uh, someone who is cutting through all of that uh, becomes attractive and people were, uh, people were attracted to uh, Buddha, Buddha's message and the simplicity and the um, the fact that this is something that I can actually sit down and experience what the priests are telling me about heaven and hell and gods and goddesses and demons and all of that I can't verify, but this is something that I can verify. Uh, it, you know after a few years of meditation I might give up realizing that this is also rubbish, but at least this is something which is testable in, in my uh, personal experience. So, uh, th th that's what begins to appeal to people, and uh, it, in a sense, becomes a liberating, uh, emancipating religious protest. I might as well take a few minutes and give you a feel for why such a simple uh, message or teaching actually be becomes such a powerful religious force that it begins to spread outside of India, Sri Lanka and uh, Indonesia and China and Japan and all these nations uh, begin to turn to, towards Buddhism. What Hinduism is teaching there are 
all sorts of rituals, you know. I'm from India, my mother tongue is Hindi, and I've tried to buy uh, the primary scriptures of Hinduism in my mother tongue, and I can't buy them because Hindus wouldn't print them. They said they are too sacred, therefore we don't print uh, the original uh, text because the magic of those texts is in correct enunciation, uh, correct pronunciation. Uh, it's not about uh, exegesis and interpretation meaning you don't wrestle with these texts intellectually therefore you have to uh, go into a school where the teacher teaches you how to cor correctly pronounce in, in these these texts are to be used in particular rituals so what are these rituals now one of the most important rituals in hinduism was ashwamedh yagya the horse sacrifice uh, ritual only the big kings could perform that. They would take a horse and magically empower the horse, whisper in its ears uh, the all kinds of curses against all the neighboring nations, uh, kingdoms. And uh, the horse will be let loose for six months or 12 months. Wherever the horse went, the king went. Behind him would be the king's sons and the army, 100 or so young. Uh, soldiers and they would claim wherever the uh, horse is gone they would claim uh, the king's authority that this is uh, our rule and if people resist uh, don't acknowledge the sovereignty of this ruler mighty ruler who is performing this uh, yagya this ritual then um, uh, there would be war so uh, this is a, a powerful ritual and most of the rituals are seeking material benefits from gods among other things, what the ritual involved was the chief queen having sex with uh, the horse, spending a whole night with the horse. Sometimes the horse had to be dead before she would have sex with him, sometimes alive. And while she's spending a whole night in sexual intercourse with this horse, three queens have to be moving around the two of them. Uh, chanting obscenity, sexual obscenities. Then the priests would perform rituals to cleanse these women, uh, queens. At the end of the uh, ritual, the king would offer his wives to the priests who have been performing these rituals. And uh, then they would return their wives to the king in exchange for expensive gifts, etc., etc. Now, this is the kind of religiosity uh, that is uh, being practiced and you can begin to see that how priest craft, craft has been exploiting using gods and goddesses and myths and stories and their access to these secret sacred scriptures to deceive the masses, exploit the masses uh, and Therefore, when someone comes along with offering a path to salvation which appears to you that you can in fact practice it, believe it uh, and test it and have the kind of experience that he had become enlightened, then you are obviously attracted to it. So that's, um, that's how Buddhism gets started in India. But a little later we must discuss then why was it uh, particularly uh, uh, completely thrown out of India. It ceased to exist in India. N not only did Buddhism spread in Asia under uh, one of our uh, most famous emperors Ashoka, but actually right after at the time of Alexander the Great, which is 300 years before Christ, Buddhism began to make an impact on Europe. There was a Greek philosopher, there were two Greek philosophers who traveled uh, with Alexander and one of them was Pyro of Elis. He came and he encountered these naked ascetics uh, in uh, in Afghanistan, this was India, uh, Afghanistan border. And through them, he understood Buddhist philosophy 
the impact of that interaction philosophical action on Greece was profound and it became the basis for Gnosticism which is being revived in the west now including through novels such as the Da Vinci Code. So, the Gnosticism Greek Gnosticism which uh, Paul and Apostle John uh, begin to confront in the first century after Christ. So, even before the uh, first generation of Christian leadership is dead was influenced through Buddhist philosophy. The significance of it we will talk in a few minutes. So, what began in India 25, 2600 years ago and began to spread in Asia also came to Europe and my own belief right or wrong is that in fact, by the 5th, 6th century Europe, the West would have become Buddhist, but for Saint Augustine. It was Saint Augustine who preempted the hold of spread of Buddhism in the West. And now that Augustinian world view of the Bible, the biblical Augustinian world view is being undermined, has been undermined in the West. The West is once again ready and susceptible for the growth of Buddhism. So, we will return to that in a moment. The important thing to uh, focus is that if Buddhism is an escape into emptiness and nothingness, the most important reason for that is that Buddha rejected the notion of God, the idea of God. And he had very good reasons for rejecting Buddhist ideas of God or gods. First problem was that there were millions of gods and goddesses in India being taught by Hindu philosophers, teachers, Brahmins. So, you are talking about millions of gods, one god ruling the rain and another the thunder and another the hailstorm and the fire and the uh, bush and the river and the mountain and the cities etcetera, etcetera, all sorts of gods. But nobody knows any of these gods. So, you have lots of gods, you tell their stories, but you do not know any of them. The only God that the enlightened Hindus knew was themselves. Hindu priests were all Brahmins. So, they call the supreme God Brahma. The supreme God is Brahma. I am a Brahmin. Who is Brahma? The answer was Aham Brahma asked me, I am Brahma. When I go into myself in meditation and have a mystic experience, I experience Brahma myself. So, Brahmins are Brahmas. So, for all practical, uh, all practical reasons, although there are millions of gods, it is the Brahman that you have to worship, the priest. You have to pay homage to him. Even a 10 year old Brahman who might be a rascal is a god for a king, a Kshatriya. A Kshatriya must worship him, offer him presents, gifts, etcetera, etcetera. So, this obviously became a manipulative, exploitative uh, god became a means through which the priests exploited the people and therefore, rejecting that god, that notion of god was liberating people from a religious system which was exploitative. So, the idea of God was a means of exploitation. The second problem was that Buddha is struggling with the fact of suffering. He has seen suffering. If there is a God, why is there this kind of suffering? If he created this world, he must be a terrible God. So, it is better to believe that there is no God than to believe that there is a God and he created, he inflicts this kind of suffering upon us. So, Hinduism did not offer a credible explanation for suffering. Well, it did as we talked about last time, which was karma and reincarnation, but uh, that okay, God is not responsible for suffering, your karma in previous life bring this suffering upon you. And, uh, uh, but then 
who are you? If you are Brahma, if God is within you, your soul is divine, is the infinite self, is God, then it is God who is reincarnating, it is ultimately God, then does become responsible for all the bad karma and all the suffering. So, uh, Buddha then rejects that explanation uh, of um, uh, suffering. The, the third uh, uh, problem, uh, the, the third factor why uh, Buddha rejects faith in God is that all the Hindu gurus are saying that you really know God, experience God, find out God, become God by going within yourself in your own consciousness through meditation. And as Buddha goes within himself, when he has had his moment of enlightenment, he doesn't find God there. He doesn't even find himself there. He finds nothingness, silence. It is a vivid, mystical experience, but what he has found there is that ultimately there is nothing. So how did this universe come into existence? Either something has to be there from the very beginning which created everything and says Buddha does not find him inside, inside of himself, that is the only place he looks at because that is where he is told he needs to look. Uh, he he does not find God, the creator there. Or everything has come out of nothing, so there was originally nothing out of which everything has come. And I want to go into that ultimate reality which is nothingness. So, everything has come out of nothingness and that is where I am going and that is where I in fact did go in my mystical experience into emptiness, silence, shunya, void. So, Buddha rejects the Hindu idea of God. And he is incisive enough to understand that if God does not exist, then human soul or self cannot exist either. There is no self, there is no soul. And then whole religious exercise becomes an exercise in deconstructing our notion of self. I am suffering because I believe that I exist and I reincarnate. How do I, do I achieve a kind of consciousness where I no longer exist and I no longer reincarnate? So, the first noble truth that life is suffering means that life without suffering is not possible. So, the only way to escape suffering is to escape life itself, existence itself. That is what becomes the goal. Now, um, if I may interrupt the flow by uh, reminding you that how completely opposite it is, uh, the whole world view is to the gospel. The angels, the gospels became, begin by angels announcing joy to the world. Why are they announcing joy to the world? Because life was not intended to be suffering. It was intended to be bliss. That is what Eden means. Eden means bliss, paradise. God put Adam and Eve in perfection, bliss to enjoy this creation, to enjoy one another as husband and wife and to enjoy fellowship with God. Life was meant to be bliss. It has fallen, it has rebelled against God, there is pain, there is suffering, there is old age, there is death. But the Savior has come, He is now changing, He has taken the curse upon Himself, He is removing the curse, He is bringing salvation. So, there will be a time when there will be no sorrow, there will be no tears, every tear will be wiped away and 
uh, there will be the Sabbath rest, perfection. So against that um, background of the biblical worldview, uh, we, we need to appreciate Buddha's point of view that since the life that I see, and this is a life in the pre-modern world where there is no justice system, where there is no prison system and uh, no police and independent judiciary and no press, every political power is brutal and oppressive and there are constant wars and people, tribes raiding other tribes and looting and killing and there is uh, no hospital, no nursing care, no insurance no education, no industries and technology, etc. Life is really miserable, as Thomas Hobbes said uh, in the beginning of the Enlightenment, that life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. That's what Buddha is experiencing. So, if life without suffering uh, is not possible, you have to escape life. And what he is saying is that since God doesn't exist, you can't exist you don't exist, your notion of self is an illusion. That has to be deconstructed. Now we can return to the first point that I made and repeat myself uh, with a little more clarification. I said that the notion of self is one of the foundational myths of secular western worldview. By that I meant that when the Enlightenment began with René Descartes, uh, René Descartes the French mathematician, uh, right after the Reformation, um, he is a rationalist that without God's revelation, without the Bible, we can know truth, human mind can know truth. So how he begins to demonstrate. I can doubt everything. I can doubt that God exists. I can doubt that the universe exists. I can doubt you exist. I can doubt I exist. But I can't doubt that I'm doubting because that would be self-contradictory. I'm doubting means I'm thinking. So his first self-evident fact was that I think therefore I am. Now, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, deconstructed uh, Descartes' argument and he pointed out that from the fact that you are doubting, you can only deduce that doubting exists, thinking exists. You can't conclude that the thinker also exists unless you can prove that every effect has to have a cause and that's something you haven't proved, that every effect has to have a cause. So thinking exists, does thinking have to be caused by someone? That you have to prove, which you haven't proven. So the fact that thoughts exist doesn't prove thinking exists, but Descartes assumed that man is both body and mind, body and soul, and soul and body interact in the pineal gland. So, this Cartesian dualism of mind and matter, body and soul, became foundational to the enlightenment movement. Now, this was not a problem for a Judeo-Christian worldview, for the biblical worldview, because the biblical worldview begins that in the beginning God created heavens and the earth, God is there. He created heavens and the earth, the material universe. He took a lump of clay, Adam, and he breathed his breath into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul. So there is a dualism, there is body, there is the breath of God, there is the spirit of God. Man is a compound of mind and matter mind, self-consciousness, the image of God is not part of nature but imposed upon nature, given to nature in human beings. So although Hume rejects Descartes' logic, the Enlightenment project continues to believe 
in the West that man in fact is both mind and matter. Mind is real, self is real. So even when you have completely atheist uh, thinkers such as Sigmund Freud, they continue to talk about self, you know, mind, subconscious mind, unconscious mind, etc., etc., that uh, vocabulary continues because they are building on, they are borrowing, the secular mind in the West is borrowing a Judeo Christian assumption that soul is real. So, whereas belief in soul was integral, a uh, consistent part of the Christian worldview, biblical worldview, it was alien to the secular worldview. S secular mind simply hijacked it from the Christian worldview and incorporated. So, even Freud's followers, such as Carl Jung, would continue to talk extensively about self. But the behaviorists, Watson and Skinner and all, began to seriously challenge it, that in fact mind is an illusion. Mind is uh, just epiphenomena. All that you have is brain. You have chemical reactions. Mark Epstein, who wrote Thoughts Without a Thinker, a book on Buddhist psychology. This is an alternative to materialist psychology. The materialists believe matter is real, eternal. Well, how do you prove? You can't prove. You can't know. You have no way of directly experiencing matter. What you have is sensations in your mind. What you have is thoughts, ideas, interpretations. So, thinking does exist as um, Descartes argues. Can thinking exist, think, thoughts exist without the thinker? This is what Buddha has been saying is in fact the case. And now, the Western psychology having rejected uh, the um, pseudo psychology of Freud and Jung and the deadly psychology of behaviorism is finding Buddhism a possible much better, uh, uh, possibly better explanation that yes, what exists is really ideas, thoughts. So, Buddha had a 12 step theory of what he called dependent origination, a kind of theory of evolution or devolution. Ultimate reality he postulated is ignorance, because if there is no God, then there is no logos, there is no word, there is no reason, there is no logic in the universe. If there is no rationality ultimately, there is no rational person, there is no rationality in the universe, then what you have is ignorance and out of ignorance arise imagination. Out of imagination arise what he called name and form, corporeal existence. You imagine shapes, body, etcetera. And then arise self-consciousness and there's a, then arise desire and then arise suffering, etc. So, he has 12 steps of devolution that all of this world has devolved out of ignorance. The ultimate reality is ignorance, not word, logic, sense, etc. Now, this is important. The uh, point that I am making to recapitulate, because this is heavy material, to recapitulate. Buddha begins by rejecting God, the idea of Hindu idea of God. So, this is unreal, I am not going to accept it. But if there is no God, he correctly realizes there cannot be a soul. There is nothing permanent. You are not the same person you were an hour ago. There are different chemical reactions happening, different thoughts arising, different desires arising. Uh, there is no real you, as we would say today, or the materialist would say today, there is just a bag of skin, leather, in which a lot of chemical reactions are happening, which keep changing. So, there is nothing permanent. You can't swim in the same river twice, as Buddhists would say. So, uh, soul does not exist and because you do not exist as a individual soul self, which has free will, which is like God, initiates, becomes the first cause, initiates decisions and actions. 
sin is not real. You're not responsible. There is no, no such thing as sin because there is no one there to hold you accountable. There is no one there who has given any commandments that thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. So you're not guilty of breaking any law. And there is no one there against whom you have rebelled. So there is no God, there is no self, there is no sin. Therefore there is no savior. God isn't there who can come here to save you from your sinfulness or suffering. If there is to be an end of suffering, you have to do it yourself. Not only there is no savior, ultimately your rationality is real, uh, is unreal. Logic is unreal because the universe is not a product of a mind. It's not logical. It's as you begin to go into yourself, you're sitting in meditation, you have all sorts of imagination, they are self-contradictory, they go, your mind goes haywire like you are on drugs, uh, drug experience and mystic experience are not very different and then you know that you don't know what is real, what is not real when you are going inside of your brain and having these <clears throat> drug experiences. So ultimately there is no such thing as reality. Nothingness is the ultimate reality. Out of that nothingness or ignorance, all kinds of imaginations and ideas arise. So let, let's, let's uh, in order to understand that, let's look at it from the point of view of a materialist, a Darwinian materialist, naturalist who only believes that matter is real. There is no God, matter is real, matter becomes life, life evolves, becomes human beings, thoughts arise. Because self-consciousness is a product of blind chance, irrational forces, what is a product of blind chance cannot be a means of knowing truth. So mind cannot be a means of knowing truth. That means that in order to know the truth, you have to kill your mind, you have to kill your rationality, kill your thinking. Now, this is what I meant when I said that Buddhism offers a practical route, route to escape from reason, escape from rationality. If you have been hearing during the last 20, 30 years a lot of talk about, against the left brain, that this is left brain logic, stop it have feeling, intuition, channeling, uh, mystic experience of feelings, trust your feelings, not your logic. That's because the postmodern modern mind in the West has become very suspicious of that whole modernist uh, project, uh, Descartes' reasoning that reason can know truth. Now we know that reason cannot know truth because reason it is a product of uh, irrational chance, blind chance. And that's essentially what Buddha is saying. So that's where modernism and Buddhism, uh, postmodernism and Buddhism dovetail. Okay, so there is no God, there is no soul, there is no sin, there is no um, uh, uh, savior. Though obviously in practice then Buddhism have to invent sin, the evil and they have to invent reincarnations and saviors, the whole concept of bodhisattva uh, that Buddha himself is a savior, a kind of a savior and many other saviors have come, Dalai Lama is a savior. So uh, they, they, but, but the, essentially in pure Buddhism these are all pseudo saviors, pseudo sin, pseudo self, none of this is real. And what this means then is that there is no hope. Life is suffering. Escape from suffering does not mean a world with less suffering or a world without suffering. So Buddhist monks aren't <coughs> fighting disease. <coughs> they aren't inventing technologies. They aren't cultivating science, sciences and understanding ways of efficient government or efficient organization of business to maximize uh, profit and minimize uh, difficulties and hardships, etc. It isn't pro creating, producing wealth. This is not what, uh, what it is all about. 
Uh, by definition, life without suffering is not possible. The only way to escape suffering is to escape a life itself. So, it becomes a pessimistic, cynical, um, um, <clears throat> escapist, escapist worldview. Now, this is in fact what begins to capture the fascination of Greek rationalists 300 years before Christ. Plato started the academy where there was rational quest, but soon after Plato, skepticism became part of Greek rationalism. You know, you hear a philosopher and you are impressed, you agree with him and you hear another philosopher who critiques the first one and you think that, well, yes, the first one actually was wrong, second one is right. You hear the third philosopher who critiques the second one and the fourth who critiques the third one and you begin to doubt all of them. By the time the sixth philosopher has critiqued the first five, you begin to doubt the sixth one and you think maybe someone else will come and show me what is wrong with this guy. Now, this is skepticism and skepticism is healthy thing. It is part of rationalism and it is assuming that, uh, uh, that with the skepticism is assuming that with careful use of our mind, we can distinguish falsehood from truth. So, mind can know truth. So, this is relative skepticism and this is still optimistic. It believes that human mind's mind can know truth if it is used rigorously, carefully and incisively. But, when Pyro is going with Alexander the Great meeting with these uh, Indian philosophers, they destroy Greek rationalism that what is mind? Where did it come from? If there is no God, there is no soul, there is no mind, ignorance is ultimate reality, not logos. Mind is a product of ignorance. Mind therefore, cannot know the truth. Therefore, only way to know the truth is find ways of transcending thought, killing the mind. So, what happens to Pyro is his relative skepticism is turned into absolute skepticism. Absolute skepticism says mind by definition cannot know the truth. This is pessimism. This is where, where the western mind has now come. This absolute or radical uh, skepticism that mind cannot know truth, nobody can know truth, becomes the breeding ground for mysticism. That is what happened in Greek Gnosticism. If mind cannot know truth, let us kill the mind. Let us develop psychotechnologies, meditation techniques, yoga, etcetera to kill the mind. Radical skepticism was the breeding ground for Greek Gnosticism. Today, if pr professors, psychologists, scientists are becoming Buddhists, again it is because relative skepticism of rationalism has become absolute skepticism. There is pessimism, cynicism, pessimism about uh, our, our mind and therefore, the attempt to kill the mind. Now, what, what does that do? What it does in practice is best illustrated with this monk uh, in the middle of the 12th century. He travels in eastern uh, China. Uh, this is about 1140, 1150. Around the same time as Oxford and Cambridge are being turned into uh, these are Christian monasteries in Oxford and Cambridge which are becoming universities. So, these Christian monasteries have been developing technology, music, uh, industry, businesses, capitalism has already emerged in, in, in Italy, in art, scriptorium, a tremendous intellectual activity is going on schools and gradually then these monasteries are becoming universities such as Oxford and Cambridge. Now, around that time, this uh, tr uh, monk, Buddhist monk is traveling in China and he reports that 60 to 70 percent of, in 60 to 70 percent of the monasteries, 
you can go any time of day or night, 24 hours a day, and you will hear the sound of rotating bookcases. When you read that, you would think that there was tremendous intellectual activity going on in China or India or Tibet at that point. That there are these monks in the middle of the night in the library taking books, reading them, putting them back, etc. This is what you would imagine. But in fact, that is not what was happening. These monks were rotating these sacred books and meditating on the sound of rotate, rotation, rotating bookcases. <laughs> Uh, that is salvation by rotation. <laughs> uh, the, the, the idea was that because there is no God who has spoken, word cannot lead us to truth. Word or logic or language, reason, these are our problems, thoughts are our problems, ideas are our problems. To shut out all thinking, to stop thinking, we have to meditate on sound. So, you rotate these sacred books and the sound becomes mantra. Now, that is the difference between word and mantra is word is sound with sense. Mantra is sound without sense. So, when you keep repeating a word, even if it has a meaning, but the endless repetition kills the meaning and you just have a sound. So, ultimately you prefer a a meaningless sound such as Om as mantra. And you are focusing on a meaningless sound because you are trying to stop thinking. Now, you laugh that these crazy monks were not developing their minds, they were killing their minds with the help of these sacred books and rotating bookcases. But in fact, today, in America, right here in Southern California, I have met with doctoral students who would take 10 days off every 6 months, go into Buddhist retreats, spend 10 days every 6 months practicing vipassana. Vipassana is a meditation technique which developed in India, Nalanda went to Myanmar, etc., came back in the 1960s, was rediscovered by the hippies and brought back into India and it is now right here in Southern California. So, a thousand people would go up there. Vipassana simply speaking is the opposite of yoga. In yoga, you control your breathing, intake of oxygen. In Vipassana, you just meditate on breathing, observe breathing, inhaling and exhaling, yeah, inhaling, exhaling. So, you are there with a thousand people you are not talking, allowed to talk to anyone. Only 15 minutes a day, you can talk to an instructor, but ask no philosophical question, no wise, only how, you know, that I keep thinking about my girlfriend, how do I stop thinking? Uh, uh, the, the practical questions you can ask. You eat very simply, <clears throat> you spend full 10 days silencing your mind just by uh, observing your breathing. Now, what is that saying? That saying that the rejection of God led to rejection of self. There is no permanent valuable self. Rejection of the notion of human dignity, value, the, the, the notion of fundamental human dignity, fundamental human rights, that could not develop in any Buddhist culture because individuality was not real. Sin the notion, understanding of sin did not uh, develop. The idea of sin, doctrine of sin is a doctrine of hope. The world is terrible right now, but it was not created this way. It was not meant to be this way. It has fallen. We have rebelled against God, our Father. We are being judged. We are being punished. Our desires do lead to some of our suffering. But a child who is born uh, handicapped with bodily defect is not suffering because of his karma, should not be suffering and we should be exerting effort to remove that suffering because God did not intend this world to be a world of suffering. 
he has come to save, we need to get involved with him in the task of redemption, redeeming everything that has been spoiled by sin. There will be no suffering, there will be no evil, there will be no, uh, no, no uh, pain. So therefore, the doctrine of sin is a doctrine of hope, optimism, progress. That couldn't develop in the Buddhist milieu. And then the, this big problem that I've just discussed, that if there is no God, there is no logos in the universe, there is no ultimate rationality, human rationality isn't a reflection of the uh, mind of God. So I made a statement that Europe would have become Buddhist, the West would have become Buddhist by the time of 5th, 6th century, but 4th, uh, 5th century, but for someone like St. Augustine. Augustine was a teacher of Greek philosophy. He struggled with these things, with uh, Gnosticism, with skepticism, radical skepticism. And as his mother was a Christian, as he began to read the Bible, and he was living a life of debauchery since the time of he was 15, but as he began to finally later in life began to read the Bible, he began to find the answers to these philosophical problems. That, hey, wait a minute, God is there, and if he created me in his image, I am real, I do exist, my soul does exist, and it is immortal because it is made in the image of God. I will, I'm being offered eternal life, I can live forever. Right now I'm alienated from God because of my sin, but I can be forgiven. So he develops uh, his Trinitarian view of man, which was that man is existence, intellect and will. I really do exist, out of which then developed the whole concept of human dignity and human rights. My intellect is valid, it's not infinite, it is not perfect, but it is made in the image of God and I need to cultivate it, use it to establish my dominion over this earth. Therefore, he writes the curriculum which becomes the educational curriculum for Europe for a thousand years. And I have a will, I am responsible, I make real choices and I will be judged for it. There is original sin, I have fallen into sin, but I can be redeemed and my will can be sanctified and, and revived. So salvation would include a, a moral transformation. So that view of man becomes the foundation for the development of Western civilization in, in every sphere from education to music and science and technology and the way governments are organized, uh, it's unfolding of it. And that is what people, the Enlightenment thinkers like Descartes and Hume and Freud and Jung, in fact hijack from the biblical worldview. But now it cannot be sustained without a notion of biblical God as a triune rational being and his revelation which is the word of God. So now, Modernism or the Enlightenment is dead. It cannot be revived. It cannot be saved. The only options before the West are either since European Enlightenment is dead, either turn to the Oriental Enlightenment, which is Buddhism, or turn to the light of the world. And light of the world is a whole different worldview that God really is there and he is holy. He doesn't exploit, he doesn't use, but he sacrifices himself to give us eternal life. We do have immortal souls, but if we live in sin, we will spend eternity without God. Salvation is not escaping into emptiness, but salvation is returning to our loving Heavenly Father, living in relationship with Him, being forgiven for the offenses that we have, rebellion that we have committed against God, and being embraced by His love. That's an alternative worldview of the light of the world, 
And the choice before us the, in the postmodern world is to either move towards oriental enlightenment or return to a biblical worldview, which is the light of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>